thanks everybody for joining us for the uh, final live session at JuliaCon 2020. Um, and today we have um, Professor Linda Petzold with us, you know, uh, one of the stalwarts in uh, differential algebraic equations. And uh, she's a distinguished professor uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Computer Science at University of California, Santa Barbara. And today she'll be talking to us about adventures in computing. Please take it away, Ms. Uh, Professor Petzold. Thanks, Ranjan. Um, well, it's a great pleasure for me to be here talking to you. Uh, although I wish we were, we were all in Portugal. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about some of my adventures in computing. And um, what I want you to, what, what I'm trying to convey to you is the important role that software development has played in my career. It has literally driven my career and brought me into some really interesting collaborations. Um, so I'm just gonna sort of take you through first, you know, how those codes, El Sode and Dassel first came about and, uh, and then we'll move on to, you know, more recent stuff. So uh, I started my career at, right after my PhD at Sandia National Laboratory in Livermore. Um, as you can see, it was a much different time in computing. That's actually a punched card. I sometimes bring it to class and show it to my freshmen and they, they just can't believe it. Um, and, you know, there were, the computers were really big, but they were no, not nearly as power as, you, as your phone. Um, and, and at the time I was, uh, I, I was, I had done my PhD on different, on, on, a, on a numerical method for solving differential equations, ODEs. Um, and so that, those are the problems that first caught my attention at the lab. Um, and I, I really wasn't thinking about differential algebraic equations too much. It uh, wasn't what my thesis was about. It was about oscillating differential equations. But, but certainly I, I had, had some exposure to it in, uh, in my research group. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. Okay, so um, the first thing I did when I got to the lab was there was a there was a, a on my desk there was this giant pile of papers and I asked my supervisor, uh, well, what should I be doing here? And uh, he said, make yourself useful. And I was like terrified, you know. I mean, useful? That's not like what how PhD students think of themselves usually. Uh, I thought maybe I'd write some papers or whatever. But anyway, I sort of took that up to heart and uh, you know, tried to do some useful stuff. So the first thing I thought of is why should users have to decide whether their problem is stiff or not? So, it, so I developed this code um, in the pharmaceutical industry. They, they, all, they seem to call it else soda, um, but it was, I always thought of it as l -Sode A, the version of l -Sode that's automatic, that automatically chooses which um, numerical methods to use what, and decides whether and when the problem is stiff. Um, uh, so I developed that code and in collaboration with Alan Heinmarsh, who was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab across the street and who had, who had built l -Sode. So we just added that automatic part. And, uh, and now I noticed that LSODE is about available in Julia, lsode.jl. Um, so that pleases me. Okay, and the, sec the second thing I started noticing was that a lot of people I had lunch with were doing computational combustion. Um, and, uh, so I wrote the precursor of DASL um, with the idea of speeding up computational models of combustion. Uh, and, and the picture there is a burner stabilized premix flat flame, which we were doing a lot of computations of in those days. And um, it was the, these users, and in particular, my supervisor, Bob Key, uh, who pushed me to release the code. I thought that the code needed a lot of improvements. 
Um, but, you know, he was like, well, look, all these, he had already given it to, uh, 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 he was a computational combustion person. He had already uh, given it to people in the Combustion Institute at Sandia National Laboratories in Livermore, and they were all really happy. So he was like, why shouldn't, why shouldn't you release it? I was like, oh, it's not perfect yet, blah, 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 blah. Um, but then I released it and uh, it got better, you know, because people started using it and sometimes it may not work quite as well as they'd like. So they'd get back to me and I, you know, I've, I've always felt that uh, when I wrote a, when I write a code, um, I'm responsible for it. You know, the first, uh, maybe not for the rest of my life, but it seems like that might be true. Um, but certainly in its early days, when users would contact me and say, well, this doesn't seem to be working quite right or something like that, um, I'm like right on it, you know, because those are the people, your early users, who are in a way kind of, kind of risking their, in those days, there weren't that many codes to choose from. They're kind of risking their careers on your new thing, you know, so I, I'm always very respon responsive to, to users. Uh, and I noticed now that Dassel is, there's a Dassel.jl. So that's pretty cool. Okay. okay, but what really motivated Dassel and all the research that went with it um, was this problem. It was the Solar One um, Solar Central Receiver Power Plant at Barstow, California. And uh, the part, uh, so what happens here is um, they're now on Solar 3, they're building Solar 3 in Barstow, um, is that there's this big field of mirrors, okay? And the mirrors, they can adjust the angles uh, adaptively during the day to, uh, with some other computer program. Um, to so that the mirrors are capped best capturing the sunlight and they're capturing the sunlight and sending it back to that the top of that big tower that's called the central receiver um, and we were interested in and then what happens is the top in the tower it gets really hot and it heats up some fluid okay and at least in solar one that fluid was uh uh, initially water, and it goes down uh, and, and drives a uh, boiler or something. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it, dri it drives the power, it, it drive creates the power, okay. Um, and uh, so they were, they were doing these computations of fluid flow in the pipe, um, and uh, the, the early version of Dassel that I had written for the combustion people uh, crashed. It crashed bad. <laughs> it crashed fatally. Um, and it, and, and I, of course, the, the code wasn't that old. So I thought, well, okay, there must be a bug in this somewhere. So it took me several months of debugging before I finally realized that the, the problem was a mathematical problem, not a code bug. I mean, literally, I had the, that was in the days of um, uh, fan fold computer paper. Maybe only part of the audience can has a vision of this, but they're like all the pieces of paper are uh, are, are are sort of connected together, um, and they're, they're really big. And I had them all over my floor, like <laughs> looking for the bug. Um, but but it it what I mean, I found some bugs but they weren't big bugs. Uh, the big bug was nowhere to be found. And so I just started thinking differently, like, well, is there, can I create a problem that would be a lot simpler than this problem? Because this is a discretized PDE, which in those days was a big problem. Um, and uh, can I create a problem that's simpler than this problem, but that gives the same bug? Um, so I, it didn't take long, you know, once you're convinced that something is happening, uh, you know, that you don't understand and that it's real and that it's not a bug, really doesn't take very long to come up with some thoughts about that. And, uh, and it, those were the first, you know, ODEs uh, that I looked at. 
uh, or DAEs that I looked at, and I wrote a paper about it. Um, Jean Gallup, who invented the SVD, once said it was the paper with the flashy title. It was called um, DAEs are not ODEs. Uh, it wasn't like a scheme of mine to make a flashy title. Uh, that was just what the paper said, so I sort of put it in the title. Um, and it just seemed practical to me at the time, but actually I learned a lot from that little experience with the title because a flashy title advertises your work. Um, and I probably would have been mortified at the time that I was advertising my work. Um, but, but by nowadays I realize that's really important. And uh, you know, I, I, honest, honestly, I stumbled into a lot of things uh, in the early days. Okay, <laughs> so in 1985, still like ancient history, I moved to Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Wasn't that big of a move to me because literally I parked in the same parking lot every year, every, every day. Um, and when I was there, I, I, I had an opportunity. I was funded uh, by uh, the Department of Energy and they were interested in the theory of DAE. So I had an opportunity to spend some serious time uh, developing theoretical results. Um, and at the same time, the problems, of course, the computers got more powerful and the problems became much larger. Um, so, and, and, and so I worked with uh, the people I was working with there, Peter Brown and Alan Hindmarsh from my research group. And um, they, uh, to, re to make a new version of DASL, that instead of having a dense linear algebra, it had preconditioned Krylov methods. Um, and that seemed to be very popular because you know people had these big problems to solve and uh, we provided them a code so we all felt good about that. Um, at the same time, I was still doing um, theory and uh, I wrote this book. Um, so there's a little sort of story behind this book. So. Um, Kathy Brennan and Steve Campbell and I, who had worked together before, um, were, we were going to write a survey article about DAEs, like for SIAM review. And we, we started like making an outline, you know, so that we could divvy up tasks to the three of us and stuff. And uh, once we went, in, so we started that like before lunch. And uh, by lunchtime, it had become two articles because there were a lot of results. So, and then after lunch, we continued and it became three survey articles. And then Steve Campbell has written books before. He said, oh, well, this is a book. I mean, we should write a book, you know? And Kathy and I were sort of really scared, you know? <laughs> like, well, that's a lot of work, you know? Um, but uh, he explained to us that, uh, you can, uh, books, you can negotiate only light refereeing, of course. And we all know that the worst thing about writing papers is responding to the referee reports. So, um, so we, and, it, we, and we said, Kathy and I said, are you kidding? You know, <laughs> that's a deal. Um, so, you know, we, we, we wrote a prospectus for the book and, and uh, you know, sent it to some publishers and Siam gave us a really uh, great deal on the refereeing and, and agreed to publish it um, paperback because uh, although the original edition, wait a minute, this isn't the one. Um, we went with, I guess it was, El, yeah, El, El Sevier and uh, that then the so the book was a little bit expensive, um, but then uh, later we Elsevier, you know, it didn't make as as much money as they like, um, and Siam decided to make it part of their classics series. So as you can see, I'm like just bumbling around, you know. There's never been a great plan, um, but or maybe the great plan has just been make yourself useful and, and write software, you know, because what could be more useful than software? But I wanted um, 
uh, go on a little bit of a tangent here, um, just to show you that conferences can also drive your career, um, especially, you know, I, not, not all of them, okay, but sometimes you just mm, learn the, some really exciting things and meet some really exciting people that you sort of click with. <laughs> and uh, this, that was the case for this conference on methods for uh, mechanical si system simulation in Snowbird, U Utah in 1989. Uh, it was really a conference about F equals MA. One of the, one of the people who funded my work on this <laughs> once said, I never knew F equals MA could be so hard. Um, and it was sort of, uh, there were people with applications and then there were people with the software and mathematics. So kind of a small group. Um, and we all just got along very, very well and, and found some interesting things to do. I ended up working on F equals MA because of course that's a, a high index uh, DAE. Um, and so I thought, okay, there's a lot of challenges for the theory and the numerics. And uh, these people were all, not all, but many of the people I met were really fun to work with. Um, so some of the things, you know, I, for a long time, I had this idea that I just want to be driving along the, the road and know that that car that I just passed was designed with my software. Um, at the time, it seemed like, you know, the most exciting thing I could, I, I could envision doing. Uh, and it's still pretty exciting. Um, this, uh, if you go uh, look at the, uh, at the uh, I'm a little lost because I don't have a pointer. Um, but if you look at the bottom left picture, I don't remember the name of this thing, but this is a giant thing. Uh, this particular one's in the army. It's sort of like a Disney ride. You go into that capsule and um, it feels like you're driving the car that a designer just designed, okay? Designer puts their, uh, in, inserts their design into a computer program, translates it into a system of differential algebraic equations, you know, because there's just huge numbers, not huge numbers, but uh, large numbers of components in your engine that are connected to each other, those are the constraints, all following F equals MA, and the person sitting in that capsule can then experience what it's like, okay? This is, so, so they're gonna drive these, uh, 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 the structure underneath it in such a way that it feels like for the person in that capsule that they're actually driving the car or the tank or whatever uh, in the, on the road or in the terrain. And I thought, oh, this is so exciting. Um, it's like a toy, you know, your, it's your, your, your big toy that you can play with. Um, so I was really excited about that for a while. Uh, and I learned about shock absorbers in tanks. They don't have any, um, which is really scary. <laughs> um, but, um, but anyways, um, this other picture is, the, is a really interesting problem that came up uh, working with industry. And uh, it's about washing machine. And you wouldn't think that washing machine would be all that interesting, um, but, uh, but, but it really, it is. Um, and why is that? Because if you put a, I think we've probably all done this, put like a rug in your washing machine and then it starts vibrating and you're hoping that it doesn't break itself and it's making huge amounts of noise. So you're, so you're rushing over the wash machine to realign the load. And some uh, manufacturer had the idea of, well, okay, let's sense that and uh, correct this, this imbalance so that people don't have to go through this ridiculous uh, bit of stuff. Uh, and that turned out to be a really hard problem at the time that drove some theory Okay, so in 1991, I went to the University of Minnesota. One thing I've learned um, is that when you move, especially to a, to a different place, the problems that you're working on may change 
um, drastically, okay, because the industries, uh, even like this army tank, you know, our, a certain uh, army place near, near Minnesota, um, you know, just the problems that people are thinking about tend to be, many of them tend to be driven by the economics of their state. Um, so that's what's so great about California, you know, a tremendous number of interesting high tech problems. Uh, but uh, so in there, I started doing sensitivity analysis and I had this idea of making gas PK better. Uh, so sensitivity analysis and model reduction for chemically reacting systems and uh, parameter estimation and optimal control. These were all extensions of, uh, of DASL, okay? And uh, with applications to tank design and, and, I, and I saw sort of my first biology with, which came in the form of tissue engineering. Uh, Minnesota is a big, University of Minnesota is a big tissue engineering place um, where, you know, the idea was to make a bio artificial artery. Of course, we didn't succeed in those early days, um, but it was still exciting. Um, I, so yeah, so I got, I, I wanted to ride in the tank, but then the army told me I had to spend uh, uh, three days in, uh, in a class before I could even just ride in it. Um, and, then, and then at the same time, I was starting to uh, uh, write this book, uh, Computer Methods for Ordinary Differential Equations and Differential Algebraic Equ Equations. And I don't know why we, uh, Asher and I, we met at a conference and uh, we, we were the only Americans at this conference. So, you know, they had us staying in, uh, in the same lodging and we had to take a bus to the conference every day together. Um, so we got talking about the classes that we teach and uh, we, we discovered that we taught sort of the same class, which was considerably a different way of teaching it than other people were using. And so we thought it'd be just really quick to combine our lecture notes and turn it into a, uh, a, a book, a textbook. Um, but it turns out to be not that quick, <laughs> okay? Um, writing a textbook, no matter whether you have lecture notes or not, um, is a far, a far cry from combining your notes uh, is a tremendous amount of or other details and organizations and, or organizing um, that it takes. The good part is that um, I've had a, a, a book that I totally agree with uh, that I can teach from. So it's good, I guess. Okay. So, um, so where do all the applications to DASL and DASPK and LSODA, where do they come from? Okay, so it turns out that engineers and scientists who have to solve their problems, this is what they're trained to do. Okay, they're great at finding tools. Um, so all you really have to do is make it available. Oh, and maybe go to some of their conferences and, and talk about it, talk about problems you've been able to solve, etc. Um, and, and then lots of people are using your code. It's really kind of, a, it's a no brainer really. Okay, so uh, 1997, I moved to UCSB where I'm now. Um, and I started by doing more DAEs. It seemed like there was an endless amount of stuff in DAEs to do. So um, uh, I was working on parameter estimation and optimal control for DAEs and uh, doing adjoint sensitivity analysis and, uh, and looking at, at more at DAEs with, special, with spatial dependence, namely PDAs, partial differential algebraic equations. Um, some of the cool problems I, I got to do um, as you can see, the problems changed a lot when I moved to California. Um, the left uh, figure is, uh, um, it, it's the trajectory from NASA of a, uh, a, a satellite, satellite uh, spacecraft 
that was going to um, uh, go from the Earth to a halo orbit uh, near the sun that was going to hang out there for two years and collect the solar wind and then come back. Um, it's a sort of science fictionary, fictiony trajectory. Uh, I have to say that's not the part that we worked on, too bad. <laughs> um, but what we worked on was um, if it, it, so these are really cheap spacecraft. Uh, interestingly enough, I, ha I have a student right now who's, who's working with NASA on cheap spacecraft. This time they're going to go out and explore the universe. Um, but you know they 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 could do less in in 1997. So they're going to hang out there and collect samples, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what we were worried about is that um, just a small perturbation in the trajectory when you uh, when you lift off uh, can create a a big uh, deviation from where you wanted to be. Um, and so that's likely to happen, right? But for some reason, this cheap spacecraft wouldn't be able to communicate um, with, with Earth for about 24 hours, okay? So by you make a small uh, mistake in the, in the initial trajectory, and uh, by the time 24 hours have passed, this spacecraft is farther than you'd like. Of course, it's cheap, so it's small, so it doesn't carry much fuel. Um, so we we found ways to um, make trajectories that uh, took advantage of gravitational forces and um, could uh, uh, could get to the halo orbit, maybe not as quickly as we had originally thought, but uh, but still get there. Anyway, the bottom line was it, it turns out it, it worked, it got there, it stayed there for two years and it crashed on its way back to earth. <laughs> um, I'm pleased to say that I wasn't a part of that crash. Um, that was some other team. Uh, but I think they managed to, um, to recover some of the samples, so. Okay, the other thing I was doing then was, um, uh, computations involving a chemical vapor deposition reactor. So this was chemical vapor deposition of superconducting thin films. Uh, we worked on that for quite a while. It's quite a challenging um, partial differential algebraic equation problem. Um, interestingly enough, I'm about to revisit that problem. Um, with the, the UCSB has a gigantic uh, NSF project called the Quantum Foundry. Um, that's all about making materials for quantum computing. So we're gonna tackle this problem in a different form, speeding up some of the experiments. Um, and, uh, and this time we're gonna try using machine learning. Okay, sometime in the early 80s, a big thing happened in my life. I met Dan Gillespie. He was a person who was so far ahead of his time that like 15 or 20 years earlier, he had been a big proponent of discrete stochastic simulation and, and at the time for, for chemical reactions. And at the time the chemists weren't, weren't very impressed, you know, they were like, why would you want to do that when you could solve ODEs, you know, and the, and the reason was, in those days, it was more like beaker chemistry, okay, you put your, put your, pour your chemicals in, and uh, uh, they react, and you see what happened, and stuff like that, but by, by when, uh, by the by, maybe 1990. No, by by the by the year 2000. Okay, a lot of chemistry was inside the cell. Okay, so as biologists who were in need of something like discrete stochastic simulation, they found uh, 
See, this is another example of if it's there, that some scientist or engineer can find it, you know. Um, they found uh, Gillespie's work. Um, I got introduced to Dan Gillespie by um, John Doyle, the control uh, person at Caltech. He thought we needed to talk to each other because Dan didn't know anything about um, stiff differential equations and I didn't know anything about stochastic, uh, discrete stochastic simulation. So we taught each other. Um, it really opened up a new world, a whole new world for me. Uh, and this is a world of problems in systems biology and ecology. Um, there, so we started, you know, by just doing algorithm development, okay, making better algorithms uh, for doing, it's very expensive. It's a Monte Carlo kind of thing, you know, and uh, you, you're drawing lots and lots of random numbers and taking little steps, exceedingly little time steps, <laughs> um, very frustrating. And uh, uh, if you, you know, if you want to fi find rare events, which is often true, then, uh, you know, you have to do the very, very many of these simulations. So uh, we, while we were doing that, we were trying to do it as efficiently as possible. Okay, so we were starting to do some algorithm development and make better, you know, versions of these algorithms that could run faster, but, you know, just the virtue of no matter how fast you make it, there's just a lot of simulation. You have to do these stochastic simulations many, many times um, and to explore, you know, the whole space. So, uh, so as a result, we were writing some software and I uh, said to my students, you know, we should make this available, make this publicly available. So we wrote StoKit and then uh, followed that by StoKit 2. Um, lots of people were using it. Um, some of them were coming back to me, you know, and say, well, can you do this? Can you do that? Um, and that, of course, is what drives the next generation of software. Um, so, and and you might wonder, well, why? You know, why when you had all those ODE models that can do chemical reactions, why would you do, because I asked this question at first, <laughs> um, why would you do discrete stochastic simulation? Okay, and the reason is that an ODE model can't capture effects due to small numbers of key chemical species, okay? And, the, the, the big place where this happens is in um, gene transcription, okay? There are these molecules called transcription factors that turn the genes on and off. Um, they're often available in extremely small numbers like zero or one in the cell, okay? So, um, and that is kind of very counterintuitive because you'd think, well, geez, with that much randomness, how is biology really working? You know, I mean, everything should be kind of screwed up, okay? And what seems to be happening is that usually it's doing what you think, okay? Usually cells are doing what you expect that they're be doing, you know, reproducing and blah, 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 they're on a schedule, they're, blah, blah, you know, um, they're living their lives, okay. But a few number of, a few of cells in a population are always doing something different, okay. They're, and now if, if something bad should happen to that population, okay, um, say there are bacteria in, in your gut, Okay, and you get like the stomach flu and uh, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of them lose their lives. Okay, but who's going to be left? Bacteria wise. <laughs> I think I'm going crazy, like um, thinking of bacteria as like who? Okay, but who bacteria are going to be left? Ba the bacteria that are going to be left are the ones that were we're doing something different, okay? They weren't wiped out by the same forces that wiped out everybody else. And that's where at the sort of ecological level of many organisms, 
that's really key to how organisms survive in, in changing environments. So it's, it's not really, it was a surprise, but it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise. Okay? It's just built into the way things work. It's, it's not a malfunction. Okay, and uh, I got really interested in this, really interested in this. So um, here's just some things that were happening around that time. Uh, Michael Elowitz at Caltex had, had, had a, a sort of a breakthrough article where he showed um, experimentally that this kind of meaningful stochasticity, not just white noise, okay? This is definitely not white noise. Um, he could reveal it by experiment and differentiate it from the effects of white noise. Um, so that got a lot of people interested in this. Um, at the same time, I was working on a big army project having to do with coagulation, uh, blood coagulation. And um, an interesting thing uh, that, uh, that, that is true about coagulation is that the time it takes your blood to coagulate, like if, if you prick your finger, um, is actually stochastic. You know, even if you prick your finger in the same place, <laughs> same person, same place, same needle, uh, it's, the time to coagulate is stochastic. And that's because there's a big chain of chemical reactions that have to, have to happen, you know, like first this one, and then that one, and then the next one. Um, and those first few involve small numbers of molecules, okay? So those, the times for those are going to be stochastic. Okay, so um, let's see. Yeah, let's move to the next one. Okay, now this is another problem. I started working with a biologist on this. Um, actually, it was a team of us working with a biologist. And um, this graph on the left is what we call a phase response dis distribution. Now, phase response curve is a, is a very well-known thing in, uh, in biology, in particular in circadian rhythm. Um, so circadian rhythm is what keeps your 24-hour clock. Um, it's really important, you know, for like, making you go to sleep at night and, and be uh, and, and awake at the pretty much the same time every day. Um, it, it, it's a, due to about 20,000 neurons in your brain that are situated um, just behind your eyes as you might expect because it takes light as an input. Um, it, 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 it is circadian, it, it doesn't just tell the time, it's talking to um, virtually all the organs in your body somehow <laughs> um, and uh, telling them what time it is, okay? Not by like, oh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's set, oh my gosh, it's 7.58 a.m. Okay, we are moving on. Okay, sorry about this, but we are moving on. Okay, so I got interested in spatial stochastic simulation um, which is uh, things like uh, morphogenesis. And uh, so that's a Drosophila embryo and uh, um, polarization, um, yeasts uh, mating, <laughs> okay? Po developing a projection towards the other yeast, uh, chemotaxis, and all of those um, drove the development of, it's too bad, I don't have time for this, of our big software engine, StokeSS 2.0, okay, which is stochastic simulation as a service. It's an integrated development environment where you can build a model with multi-physics, scale it up to increasing levels of complexity. Um, you can do spatial stochastic simulation in up to 3D with unstructured mesh. You can do machine learning aided parameter in inference, that's brand new. Um, you can do model exploration. So there's an inter interactive semi-supervised learning um, for large distributed parameter sweeps. 
If you're wondering what your model does in different, re in different regimes, different parts of parameter space, um, and you can seamlessly deploy, deploy the appropriate computing resources as needed because it's a, it's, it, it, it lives in the cloud. Okay. So it's building on powerful existing tools, namely Stoke 2, GLESPI 2, Spatial Pi, and SIOP. This is the well mixed uh, simulation engine, GLESPI, uh, let's see, and GLESPI 2 is a, um, Python version of that. Spatial Pi does um, the spatial stochastic simulation and SIOP, I don't remember what it stands for, but it does the uh, model exploration and parameter inference. And I noticed there, and, and we just made uh, a, without much trouble, I must add, um, GLESPI Tulia for a Julia GLESPI, and we're hoping that our other software can go into Julia soon. These are just some pictures of a yeast cell polarizing to, towards its partner to mate. And then I, I wanted to close with this, with this problem. So this is like everybody else, we're modeling COVID-19. Um, it's like some sickness, you know, we're all modeling COVID-19. But in any case, it's really, really easy to do in, uh, uh, in Stoke SS. And, uh, and, and in fact, these plots here we're doing, we're doing in um, Stoke, Stoke Tulia. <laughs> okay, okay. So anyways, um, these are pictures of population graphs from populations in Orange County, a uh, big county in California. Um, we show the, lock, the, the lockdown time uh, starting in uh, March or February, um, and, then, and then the end of the lockdown. And uh, here's the, the growth uh, in the, this is the exposed population that includes both uh, uh, that, 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 that includes um, uh, people you can't see. Okay. Uh, so people who haven't been, um, they've been exposed, but they don't know it yet. Okay, They're, it's derived by the model. Okay, and as I said, you know, we, we do a lot, we can do a lot of uh, uh, statistics at the end with the results. We, um, we, we have, here are the posts we do in the Bayesian statistics. Here are the posterior marginals of selected parameters. Um, and, uh, and here's the posterior predictive of the cumulative COVID-19 cases in Orange County. It's really pessimistic. So I, I truly hope it's wrong or that Orange County does something different soon. Okay, and with that, I wanna thank everybody. I have worked with so many people. Um, it's been a great pleasure working with all these different communities. Um, I've been really lucky to have funding agencies, uh, Department of Energy for, throughout my career, um, NSF and NIH, and NIH funds the uh, Stoke, uh, Stoke SS development and, uh, and the US Army uh, funds a lot of my work. So I just wanna thank them and all my many collaborators and, and students and former students. And thank you for listening. That's all. Well, thank you so much for such an inspiring talk, Professor Petzold. Um, so I'm just going through the chat and this is the first question I'd like to ask you is, you know, you've written a lot of software through your career. Um, do you, but do you ever think that uh, domain specialists, you know, sometimes face barriers towards becoming good software engineers and putting out codes that other people can use? And um, do you think that these, like, you know, with the Julia ecosystem, we're trying to break these barriers down so that more scientists can do that. But did you did you ever get that sense? And uh, if not, or or if you did, how how did you guys deal with it at the time? 
do they do they face barriers? Uh, well, I don't think they think of it that way. Okay, <laughs> um, I think that they think of it like uh, um, that's not their job. Okay, their job is to solve this problem, um, not necessarily all the related problems at the same time, even though for science in general, it's certainly much better to solve a whole bunch of related problems at one time and, and free people from having, from all having to write their own codes. Did that answer the question? Yeah, so sure. yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I'm just trying to go through and see if there are any other questions. Um, Let me just say that funding of software development in the, in the US government is not easy to come by, even for me. Well, that's, that's remarkable. There's a lot, I mean, I know, I know a lot of grad students who, you, who, you know, who, who would like to write software, but they can't because, uh, you know, that's, that's not the metric by which their careers are measured, right? And that's, uh, and it's always yeah. a challenge, yeah. It, it is, and it's, it might not be the best thing, you know, remember, I never was an assistant professor, you know, with a tenure clock. So it may not be the best thing to do if that's where you are in your career, um, you know, because they'll be counting publications and where did they appear and all that stuff and getting your, uh, uh, your, your, so your software articles published is easier than it was then, but it's still really hard. Um, and software takes a lot of time. I think over the course of your career, it's, uh, it, it's huge, okay? I mean, look at what it's done for me. It's brought me in contact with all these people and problems, okay? And not only that, but if you're the person who is writing the software, you know, and knows the algorithm best, the hard problems are probably going to come to you, okay? And those are the problems where you could do research. So I think uh, it, it, over the course of a career, the software is software development is uh, if you can manage it. Um, I was lucky I could manage it in the early years because I was at the lab and not at universities. Um, then it pays huge dividends. Okay, but it's like a long-term investment. Of course. Um, all right, so one, uh, one more question, probably the last question. Um, you've had, uh, you know, you've been fortunate to work with a variety of domains, right? Like a real range of domains. And, um, you know, there was, there, was a, there was a comment that went in the chat that spoke about how biological systems are just much harder than, than the other ones because you have models and you have well-defined equations, but in biology, you really don't quite know, right? And it's stochastic, as you pointed out. So did you face these same difficulties or do you like to comment on uh, natural systems versus, you know, engineering systems? Well, absolutely. You know, and when I first started working on biology, which was circadian rhythm, um, I, I used to get a headache, you know, talking to the collaborator because he would be using all this terminology and you know, after we'd meet like once a week and uh, by video conference and after it, I'd have a headache. Um, but if, after about six months, you know, you, you listen and you think and you ask them for, you know, as simple of papers as they can send you, all of a sudden it sort of clicks. So, um, but what, okay. So yeah, the biology problems are much harder, I think, um, because of all the things you don't know. But on the other hand, that is a great thing for your research in general, right? Because nothing propels your research like having to solve hard, solve hard problems or understand hard problems. All right, sorry. Um, so that's just one, one last question. What are your perceptions on the recent hype or attention differential equations are getting from the ML research communities? Oh, <laughs> are they getting attention from the, you know, uh, I, I mean, I love this part about combining the differential equation solvers with uh, differential equations with machine learning. I love it. Um, 
is it hype? Like everything in machine learning is kind of hype right now. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's good. You know, I I don't know exactly where it's going, um, but uh, but I think it offers a way to solve problems that uh, would be hard to solve otherwise. I personally think that we could use it in surrogates and model or reduction, but that's a separate conversation, Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, all right, on that note, thank you so much once more, Professor Petzl, for joining us. I think everybody really enjoyed uh, your talk. Thank um, you. Yeah, thank you.